All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to ISEC, International Space Elevator Consortium. We're going to be talking about the Space Elevator Climber with Larry Bartosik. He's a participating member of the ISEC study on the Climber Tether interface. So I'm going to just read you just a little bit about Larry, his biography in just a minute. So Larry Bartosik has a dual degree in mechanical engineering and physics from the University of Illinois and is an Illinois licensed professional engineer. He is a member of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, the American Welding Society, ASM International, the Chicago Society for Space Studies, the National Space Society, and, the, and ISEC. Larry owns Bartosik Engineering, a consulting firm which specializes in mechanical designs for the nuclear and high energy physics research community worldwide, including with many national laboratories, universities, and governments with experiments all over the world. Larry worked at Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory and was responsible for the design of the $150 million Hadron Help me, Larry. Calorimeter. Calorimeter, thank you. Weighing 4,000 tons and many other accelerator and detector projects. He has also served as consultant to the Canadian government. Larry started working on the space elevator as a hobby in 2004 and has created original designs for the space elevator climbers for which have been published in the uh, design considerations for space elevator tether climber, which is an ISIC position paper of 2013-1 and that can be found on our website. He became a director on the board of ISIC in April of 2021. He is currently member of the two-year study on the interface between the tether and the climbers for the space elevator. He is currently doing a reference conceptual design for a 20-ton commercial climber. And with that, I am going to turn things over to Larry. And Larry, go ahead and share your screen when you're ready. Okay. I hope you can see that and everybody can hear me. Yep, we can see that. And just as a reminder, um, if you would like closed captioning, please just go down to the CC or to the more ellipses and you can select enable closed captioning. It'll send a message to me and I'll be able to enable it for you. I am going to go ahead and go off video, but I'm in the background here if you should need anything. And my name is Karen Gleason. Karen, you were going to ask a general question to the audience? Yes, I am. So the general question for the audience is this. Uh, in Larry's presentation, we have a lot of math, a lot of equations. And Larry is more than willing to go into depth about the equations, or he can just say, hey, this is the equation. So we would like to poll all of you right now. And in the chat, you can just say, if you would like an in-depth um, uh, in depth on the math, please say yes. And if you would just like, these are the equations and you can maybe discuss them at a later date, say no. So if you wanna enter that in chat, I'm getting two yeses. Yes. All right. One no. <laughs> and yes, and yes, and no. All right, I will try to, for you knows, I will try to make it as least painful as possible. <laughs> yeah, we're kind of evenly distributed here, Larry. <laughs> All right. So take it away? Yeah, go right ahead, please. All right, so the space elevator uh, became my hobby slash obsession in 2004 when I started reading Edwards and Wessling's book, The Space Elevator, Revolutionary Earth to Space Transportation System. This is still a must read. This is a very good book, which has a lot of technical information about climbers and Brad and, and uh, Eric Wessling, Brad Edwards and Eric Wessling, put a lot of effort into trying to identify the major features of the space elevator. And uh, I, I use it as a reference all the time. 
So what are the, I'm going to go very quickly over the basics of a space elevator because I want to dive in deep on the climber design. But the, in the basics of a space elevator, it is a string with a rock tied on one end and the other end is tied to the surface of the earth at the equator. And because the earth is spinning, the string stretches out. And in the picture at the right, pretend I'm the earth and I'm rotating about my vertical axis and the rock is spinning around me and the string has stretched out and there's an ant walking on the string to get into space. That is, that is the space elevator right there. The rock is the counterweight at the end, the string is the tether material and the ant is a climber and we're gonna focus on the climber. So these are space elevator basics more or less uh, in reality and what you see, this curve is a curve of how rapidly gravity falls off as a function of distance away from the earth. And these are a radius in uh, thousands of kilometer from the center of the earth, because that's always how we calculate what the strength of gravity is from the center of the body. Now, because the earth is spinning at a certain rate, there is an altitude about 36,000 kilometers that we call geosynchronous orbit. If you are at a point at, in geosynchronous orbit, looking over a point on the earth, you, the point on the earth doesn't move. So it seems natural that you can extend a physical object between a point on the earth and a point past geosynchronous orbit and stretch a cable that would be our ladder into space. And the only point on the elevator that is truly in orbit is the one at geosynchronous orbit. And that's where you wanna keep the center of mass of the system. And you notice above geosynchronous orbit, the acceleration that the climber feels due to gravity goes to zero and then the, the climber has to hang on harder and harder the closer it gets to the counterweight because centrifugal force has taken over from gravity basically. All right, so why not just use rockets? Rockets have to carry their fuel with them and most of a rocket is fuel to get away. It, this, this tiny little portion up here at the top of the Saturn V is all that made it to the moon. And you can't get better than a few percent payload delivered to the moon with chemical rockets. Now, when we were in the space shuttle era, it cost about $25,000 per kilogram to put something into low Earth orbit from the space shuttle. SpaceX has managed to lower that by almost a factor of 10. And we're hoping that the space elevator will lower it by another factor of 10 or more. And what makes the space elevator different from rockets is it's powered by something else. It's powered by light or power beaming or lasers from the ground or space. So it has no onboard fuel. It has a higher payload ratio. So uh, every design starts with requirements, all right? What requirements do we have? I, there's basically three requirements I'm listing here that, that get you a long ways towards a conceptual design. Get to geo in about a week. You, want to, you, want, you don't want to take too long to get up there. You want to get up there in about a week. Rockets, of course, get into low Earth orbit in a matter of minutes, but the space elevator operates very differently from rockets. We want to carry as much payload as possible, and we want to start out with a commercially viable climber at 20 metric tons. And in, in Edward's book, and this, these numbers have propagated for years, he estimated that you could put 13 tons of payload and seven tons of traction drive. And I'll show how that turned out. And then you don't want the climber to fail in a way that jeopardizes the tether. And the reason I focus on that is because the climber is basically traveling almost the distance completely around the earth at the equator. The circumference of the earth at the equator is 40,000 kilometers. To get to geosynchronous orbit is 36,000 kilometers. And you want to make this trip completely around the world effectively in a week. And you want to do it at 200 kilometers per hour average speed. Okay, so you, this means that every element of the climber is going to be subject to metal fatigue and other kinds of failure mechanisms. And you don't want them to fail and, and hurt the tether. So I'm going to list a couple of assumptions now. This climber assumes a space elevator tether, which is just like the one in Brad Edwards' book. It's a ribbon. It's not necessarily made out of the same material. I'm completely ignoring what the tether is made out of. 
my assumptions are a certain strength, which we think is possible by a couple of materials. And so at the surface of the earth, I'm estimating the tether material is 0.3 meters wide. And at geosynchronous orbit, it goes up to 1.55 meters wide. And the reason it has to get thicker is because geosynchronous orbit is the place where the stress in the tether is the highest. It's actually carrying the load of everything below it. And it's carrying the centripetal force of the tether of the counterweight and the tether above geosynchronous orbit. So it has to get wider if it's constant thickness. And that's what I'm assuming. And based on the material properties that I put in my spreadsheet, the tether, the thickness of the tether is estimated to be 10 microns. All of that stuff, the only numbers that are relevant to the climber design are the widths, because the climber is very capable of adapting to thicker or thinner tethers. Another assumption is it's a pinched wheel concept. Cap standing is when you wrap the tether around the wheels for some length. Uh, we're not sure if we can actually cause the, uh, the, the tension, the tether under tension to wrap around the wheel significantly. And I don't trust the way the traction forces are calculated that I've seen in the capstan design. So a pinched wheel means there are two wheels at least on opposite sides of the tether. The ribbon runs between them. The wheels are squeezed towards each other, pinched wheel design. And these are the fundamental uh, elements of the climber. You have a wheel compression mechanism and you have an emergency eject system. Something has to allow the climber to separate at any altitude. And you have motors and brakes and wheels and axles. And I'll go into the mechanical details of those. Uh, this, another group of assumptions which affects the design of the climber tremendously is the tether has a coefficient of friction with the wheels of 0.1. Now, this was a value that I settled on back in 2004 when I did the first climber design, because if you go below 0.1, you are in the region of lubricants and the tether becomes very slippery and it becomes very difficult to climb if it's slippery. You can imagine if you have a, a, a slippery rope. People told me back then, and I think it's still true, that the coefficient of friction is not likely to be much over 0.1 just because of the materials that we're considering making the ribbon out of. But we would like to get to at least 0.1. If it goes much under, we have trouble designing the climber, a lot of trouble. And, the, and the, another assumption in this design is I'm gonna use only commercially available uh, parts if possible, and I'll show you where it becomes not possible. And the, and the components may not be space worthy, but they're existence proofs. You can make a standard component space worthy. Now, these assumptions that I've listed here come from 18 years of working on climber designs and 39 years of being a mechanical engineer. And I'll show you some of, some of those assumptions at play. So we start with the basics. A design always starts with a mathematical model. You saw a sketch. Now, you, now you're going to see a mathematical model. And you can size every component of the climber from the mathematical model. So what do we have here? We have one wheel. And we have the ribbon. And we have the friction between the wheel and the ribbon. F and N are the opposing forces. N is actually coming from the fact that there's a wheel on the opposite side of the ribbon. The ribbon cannot exert the normal force in the zone of contact, which is why you have to squeeze two wheels together. The, the weight of the climber is transmitted to the, to the wheel from the axles and from the bearings and gets transmitted to this tiny little zone of contact where the friction force holds up the climber. So we have acceleration forces, the rotary moment of inertia of the system. We have the torque coming from the motors. We have uh, omega, which is the rotational speed of the wheel, the, ro the radius of the wheel. And this is my coordinate system. And so on this slide, and Karen is going to make this talk available to people who want to go over in more detail. But all of the variables in the equations and in the diagram on the previous slide are described here. So what we basically do and what every mechanical engineer does in any design is you start with Newton's second law. And in this case, we are summing the moments about the zone of contact, the place where the wheel touches the ribbon. And we can rearrange these terms in the summation of the moments and 
get the torque required from the motor. And the torque required from the motor is made out of two components. It's when the motor is accelerating, the rotary moment of inertia of the system comes into play and the mass of the climber, uh, the, the torque from the mass of the climber. But when the climber is not accelerating, when it's operating at constant velocity, our double dot, which is the acceleration of the climber, is zero. So the only torque that is necessary to be delivered from the motor is this torque, which comes from the weight of the climber. Basically, the motors always have to hold the climber up, whether it's moving or not, because gravity is always trying to make the, the climber roll down the tether. So what do we have so far? The equations on the previous slide allow us to calculate the torque. So we can look at the motor requirements and the whatever, if there's going to be a transmission, and we'll talk about that. And let's look at the implications of the requirements to get to geo in about a week, geo being 36,000 kilometers above the surface of the earth. If we divide that into the number of hours in a week, we get an average speed for the climber of just over 200 kilometers an hour. And I just used an average value of 200 kilometers an hour to round, make nice round numbers. The fastest electric vehicles on earth can go over 500 kilometers an hour, but they don't do it for very long. If you tried to drive an electric vehicle that hard for 36,000 kilometers, it wouldn't make it. So we did a lot of research on motors and it is still ongoing. We need the lightest, most powerful motors ever built. And our survey of the market showed that motors designed for electric aircraft combine this requirement for lightness and power. And this graph is a variety of motor manufacturers the, the, the tall blue line here is the standard General Electric series of motors, which basically pays no attention to the weight of the motor. You notice the weight gets very high for motors in the, uh, in, at the highest power range, which is 300 kilowatts. And back when I was uh, looking at earlier designs, there's a green line here, which is the line that represents the estimate that Brad Edwards came up with for motors back in, uh, he actually estimated this back in 2004 and it was still the case in 2013. And I thought at the time that any motor below this line was in the realm of fantasy because all the motors in the realm of reality were above that line. But the electric motors coming from electric aircraft and modern drive electronics changed this situation completely. And you can see MRAX has very high power motors at very low speeds. And Magnix also has uh, very high powered motors at very low masses. And this is a, a graph of the function of the torque of the motor versus the mass. So it's different from the power of the motor versus the mass. And what you can see from this graph is that the Magnix motors for electric aircraft are really in a class by themselves. They are the lightest, most high torque driven motors available that I know of. And if anybody knows of any lighter, stronger motors, please let me know because this is a, a, a driving factor in the design of a climber. We want the motors to be very light. So this is an example of the motor that I chose for the uh, reference conceptual design for uh, the, the climber using the Magnix, the Magni 650 electric aircraft motor. And you'll see a number of these features in the conceptual design CAD models that I'm gonna show you. These are the drive units, they very cleverly divided up the three-phase design of this motor into four units for redundancy. I, I followed that same scheme in designing components for the, uh, for the climber. So we go back to the math model. And knowing the continuous torque of the motor, which from the Magnix motor is 2814 Newton meters, and it rotates continuously at 1900 RPM, we make the following assumptions, all right? Every wheel is driven by a motor. We don't have any idlers. Every wheel is directly driven. We have no gearboxes. And this is how locomotives work. The electric motor can actually work as an infinitely variable transmission if it has enough torque capability. That should be the lowest mass solution. So now we have to specify the diameter of the wheel from those numbers. And we know that the continuous rotation speed of the motor is 1900. We want the average speed to be 200 kilometers an hour. We know that a wheel rotates uh, in a two pi r distance in one revolution. So given the velocity of the climber, 
<clears throat> and the number that it rotates per revolution, we calculate that the, the radius of the wheel is 279.22 millimeters, but I live in the US, all right? And I apologize for the imperial or what we call English units that appear in this uh, presentation sometimes, but as a mechanical engineer in the US, these are numbers that I am most familiar with, inches and pounds per square inch. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that a little more. Now, one thing we know is that we don't want the, the wheel so small that it rotates hundreds of millions of times to get to geosynchronous orbit or further, because then metal fatigue might cause failure of the wheels or axles. And these graphs show you, as a function of wheel diameter, how many times a wheel has to rotate to go, for example, 100,000 kilometers, a wheel has to rotate many hundreds of millions of cycles. Now, to get to, to geo, you, you only have to rotate about 20 million cycles, but, but even 20 million cycles is pretty high up in uh, metal fatigue data. And as far as the rotation speed of the motor, of, of the wheel, if the wheel is too small, if it's below four inches, the wheel is spinning between 10,000 and 20,000 RPM. And large objects don't spin that fast because the stress destroys them, destroys the motor or destroys the wheel. So now we can calculate the number of wheel pairs, right? We assume that each wheel pair has a coefficient of friction that carries an equal amount of the weight of the climber. And so we start with the known weight from the motors and we rearrange the torque and the, and the, uh, the equation for the, uh, the torque that holds up the climber when it's not climbing. <clears throat> and we use 9.8 meters per second squared for the acceleration of gravity near the surface of the earth. And we see that the mass of the climber is 20,000 kilograms. So we get that the number of wheels that have to be in contact with the tether is over 19. And since wheel pairs are always whole numbers and they're always even numbers, we need 20 wheels or 10 wheel pairs. That is because that's the amount of torque that we have available from that motor. So I did a CAD model. And this is an early rendering of the CAD model with 22 inch diameter wheels and 20 motors, 20 axles. And here's the, the tether, the very thin, strong tether near the surface of the earth that's 0.3 meters wide. And you might say, well, why are the motors so wide and the axles so long? And that's because up near geosynchronous orbit, this is a more developed uh, model of the tether, th that's how wide the tether becomes. So you need to leave room in between the structure that joins the two halves of the climber so the tether doesn't cut through it because it, it would. So there's a lot of detail in this design. And I added a whole bunch of systems and we'll talk about the subsystems. Let's talk about the, the pinch mechanism. And if, any, if I'm going too fast, or if anybody wants to talk in, uh, about something that's not clear, just, just stop, stop and let me know or let Karen know in the chat. I, I'm, if I go too fast, slow me down. But there, the mechanism that I designed back in 2004 to press one wheel against the opposite wheel on the other side of the tether uses screw jacks. And we go back to the free body diagram. We have to size the screw jacks. We have to size how much force we have to squeeze the wheels with. So now instead of using the summation of the moments, now we use the summation of the forces from that free body diagram to figure out how hard we have to press the wheels together, this, this force, as a function of coefficient of friction. And you can see coefficient of friction appears in the denominator. So the smaller that mu is, the larger this F is. And that's why we don't want mu to get much smaller than 0.1. And we've done a lot of work trying to understand the nature of friction, but this is a very simple friction model, Coulomb drive friction, in which the traction doesn't depend on the area of contact, but only on the normal force and the coefficient of friction. So once you have the normal force as a function of the coefficient of friction, you can create this plot, which tells you if you have a mu of 0.1 and a climber of a certain weight, how hard do you have to press a wheel pair together? And the load between two wheels, uh, according to this plot, is 98,000 newtons or 11.03 tons. And again, because I'm in the US, we don't buy 
uh, screw jacks in metric uh, increments, we buy them in English increments, and that would be two screw jacks at 5.52 tons. So I bumped it up to 10 tons to give me a factor of safety. Uh, and the factor of safety turned out to be about 1.7, which either allows the climber to get a little bit heavier or the coefficient of friction to slip a little bit or the wheels to not carry exactly the same load equally. In any event, uh, having a safety factor on the compression force is a good idea. So this is a cutaway sketch showing some of the details of the compression mechanism. Here is a 10 ton screw jack, which is pushing on a Belleville spring stack. And here is a, a tapered roller bearing, which is supporting the axle that supports the wheel. And this magenta block is actually designed to slide back and forth on this aluminum support structure, which is connected to the support structure that connects opposite sides of the, of the wheel, and also from one wheel to the next wheel up. So there's two different sides to the climber. One side is designed to have two 10-ton jacks, which force a, pair, a, a wheel against a wheel on the opposite side. And the wheel on the opposite side is also supported by a tapered roller bearing, but this wheel doesn't move with respect to its support structure. It looks like a fixed wheel. And in between these two uh, pieces of structure, you need to have a connection because if this wheel is being forced against this wheel with 20 tons of force, then there needs to be a connection which is capable of taking 20 tons of force in tension to react the compression in the wheels. And the reason for putting the Belleville spring stack in here is because if the, if the spring stack wasn't there, as soon as you start pressing the jack with the electric motor and gearbox that drives it, there would be a step function in the force seen by one wheel against the other. We can't control using a step function. Putting the spring stack in there gives me a half an inch to three quarters of an inch of motion of the 10 ton jack where the force can be calibrated. Now, I don't show a load cell in this compression mechanism, but there would need to be a force feedback on the force in these springs that would allow the motors to be controlled to determine how much force is, uh, is being delivered to this bearing housing and to the axle and to the wheel. So <clears throat> what kind of design choices did I make here? So I, I mentioned that I, I, I don't push directly on the axle bearing with the screw jack because of the step function. I mentioned the Belleville spring stack. Uh, the wheel bearings were chosen to be spherical roller bearings, and I'll show you why. Because the axles are as long as they are, and they're having 20 tons of force against uh, the, the wheel is being pushed against the other wheel with 20 tons of force, the axles bend a lot. So the ends of the axle where the bearings are have to be able to take an angular offset. And that's exactly what spherical roller bearings can do. I originally sized the motor and gearbox for the compression mechanism to be able to apply the full force from zero to full force in 18 seconds. And it uses a one and a half horsepower motor to do that. And if you wanna do it faster than that, you need a stronger than one and a half horsepower motor. So these are all the design trade-offs that go at some point in the future, somebody is going to do a real climber design where they have to make all of these design decisions. How fast should the, and how fast this motor operates determines the, the energy budget for the climber, which determines how much energy you need to store in the batteries. And, and the battery capacity is determined by the size of the batteries and how much time you can afford in, in the event of a power failure. We'll talk about that in a, in a minute. But first, let's go to sizing the axles. So I'm, I'm going through this almost as a, a design project that you would get as an undergraduate in, in, uh, at university, go, starting with the mathematical model, going through the, um, the uh, calculations of forces and stresses. So to make the, the axles lighter, I assumed they were made from aluminum, and I hollowed them out to reduce the weight. And I did this because I have a lot of experience designing aluminum for fatigue life. And you can find information at my website about the mini boon horn, which I used as the basis of my fatigue analysis for aluminum. And uh, there, there's a very low stress that can be allowed on aluminum, about 10,000 PSI, 68, 69 uh, megapascals 
if you want aluminum to survive uh, bending stresses for more than 100 million cycles. And, I, and, the, and the, we know that the climber weighs less as a function of altitude. So you can back off the compression force between the wheels as a function of altitude. But I ignored that in the reduction of stress. Uh, and one of the reasons is we actually, it's a very complicated problem in the sense that we're probably in the finite fatigue life region when we are below 2000 kilometers of altitude. And then we can increase the fatigue life as we back off so, so there's an integrated fatigue life over the, the length of the ribbon that we that I, I haven't calculated what the effect of backing off the force on the wheels is. So I ignored that in my reduction of stress with altitude. But I started to look at the wheel design using finite elements in Inventor. So the yellow arrows here are applying 10 tons of force to the axle. The wheels are in contact. And you learn a couple of things right away. The axles were designed to have less than 10 KSI average stresses in the middle where the stress would be the maximum. And I pretty much achieved a, a decent fatigue life with 20 tons of force compressing the wheels together. But the axles bend so much, and you can see that here, they're bending by over, over an eighth of an inch, right? That's how much the end of this axle is bending towards the other axle. Now, there is a detail associated with this fine element analysis that has to do with the boundary conditions. So the, the total deflection may be divided more equally between these two. So they're, they're very likely to uh, bend towards each other, but the boundary conditions on the fixed axle were too rigid. So the fixed axle in this, in this model isn't, isn't bending enough. But the point is it bends a lot, which is what the motivation for the, um, for the fixed for, for the spherical roller bearings. But the other thing I noticed relatively recently is because of that bending, there's a lot of stress concentration on the outside edges of the wheel. So the wheels need, we've been doing contact stress analysis, assuming solid wheels. We have to redo it much more carefully for wheels that are not solid because solid wheels would be way too heavy. These wheels are assumed to be titanium because the contact stresses are higher than any stresses that you would get with aluminum. So aluminum wheels wouldn't, wouldn't survive. So the wheels are going to be heavier. And I chose titanium as a very strong, but also very light material. I looked at stainless steel wheels. They're just too heavy. There's many materials that are too heavy. We'll talk about materials in a second. So one of the questions is, if one of the axles is moving with respect to the motor that it's attached to, how do you attach the motor to it? And, I, and if I, I have experience using Schmidt couplings. The Schmidt coupling is an absolutely amazing mechanism involving linkages between these hubs. So the motor is fixed to the support structure of the climber <clears throat> and the axle is free to move back and forth. And the Schmidt coupling connects the motor to the axle in a way that allows the axle to be free to move back and forth. And if you've never seen one operate, they're amazing. There, there are videos at the Aeromax uh, website, where you can, or Zeromax rather, where you can see uh, how they work. And, and the nice thing about this type of coupling is it doesn't uh, put a side load on the motor. So you don't have to worry about side loading the shafts of the motor. So quick disconnect mechanism. Why do we need a quick disconnect mechanism? Well, first of all, we need a connection between the two halves of the climber. The climbers are assembled on opposite sides of the ribbon from two separate machines and you need to join them relatively quickly. And in an earlier design that I did back in 2004, I just bolted the two climber halves together because it was the, the easiest and cheapest method of connecting the two halves of the climber. It has absolutely no means of disconnecting the climber at other altitudes, at any altitude, unless you made them explosive bolts. And we actually looked at that. And the problem with explosive bolts is they do offer a risk to the climber, not to the tether. You could, you could blow the explosive bolts and sever the tether. So we figured that was not the best way to go. So I designed a 20 ton uh, disconnect. Uh, each side uh, is operating at 10 tons, a quick disconnect mechanism, which basically looks like two screw jack driven turnbuckles. There's a clevis pin on one side. So as you're moving one side of the climber, uh, on one side of the ribbon and one side of the climber on the other side of the ribbon, 
This is with the, the two halves of the climber positioned uh, plus and minus an inch away from the, uh, from the tether. So the wheels are uh, an inch away from the tether. And you can see that this little turnbuckle engages with this, uh, this clevis and you shove a pin through there and there's a cotter pin that connects the, um, that keeps the pin from falling out. Now, when they're uh, connected together, it looks like this, okay? And an exploded view shows that there is a worm and wheel mechanism in a lower gearbox, which allows this turnbuckle eye bolt to completely leave. If you turn this worm and wheel hard enough in the direction that causes the eye bolt to move outwards, it will literally fall out. And that's the design, okay? So an electric motor drives a gearbox that drives these worm and wheel drives for these eye bolts that pull the two halves of the climber together and they're resisting the compression mechanism for as long as the climber is climbing. And then if something happens, if, if a piece of orbital debris causes the power to be severed, if the climber for some reason cannot continue, the batteries will drive these electric motors until the climber halves separate. And the one mechanism that is not shown, and I thought about this, you either need a spring or a cold thruster to actually force the two halves of the climber apart away from the tether so that when they fall away from the tether, they don't hit the tether. And if you, if you can put enough thrust in that, uh, that separation mechanism, then they wouldn't hit the base platform either. They'd just fall into the ocean or wherever the area is on, uh, from the earth platform. But these are things that have to be thought about, right? How do you, how do you uh, design the climbers for connectability in a hurry? And how do you get them separated in a hurry at any altitude? So let's take stock. Where has this gotten us? You saw the CAD model of the 10 wheel pair climber. That got me to the point where I could weigh it. I assigned a material to everything in the, uh, uh, assigned a material to everything in the CAD model and that allowed me to do a weight of the traction drive that was shown. And unfortunately it weighed more than 20 tons. It couldn't even lift itself up the tether uh, and let alone any payload. So back to the drawing board, something had to be rethought. And my colleague, Martin, gave me an idea for how to rethink the process. What, what I started thinking about was, given a motor, what is the implication for the climber? And that's how I got to this 10-wheel pair climber that was basically too heavy. But Martin's idea was, look at a single wheel pair and figure out what it takes to make a single wheel pair carry load. Well, I used all these calculations to come up with uh, the, the alternative. And here's the breakdown from the CAD model. What, what you see is it's death by a thousand cuts, right? But the, ma the main drivers of the weight of the climber were the motors at number one, at 200 kilograms each, the brakes. The brakes were too heavy and the brakes are gonna have to be custom designed. Uh, these are Ogura brakes that have the torque capability for the, to hold up the climber, but they're just too heavy. The axles also turn out to be a significant uh, percentage of the weight of the 10-wheel of the, uh, uh, the pair climber. Working way downwards, batteries. Batteries were a huge amount. These are lithium ion batteries. We learned later on that lithium sulfur has three times the energy density of lithium ion. So I, I reduced the volume of the batteries by a factor of three to take advantage of that. The wheels, the motor electronics, and you, as you go down, even the shaft couplings, but, but the shaft couplings represented only 2%. So 63% of the weight of the climber is in these top six components. There's where we really have to focus on reducing the weight, right? So how to lighten the climber? I looked at the 10 wheel pair climber and my first thought was, what happens if I cut it down to a five wheel pair climber? Well, if you cut it down to a five wheel pair climber, you have half as many wheels supporting the weight of the climber from the tether. And with half as many wheels, you need to squeeze them harder to get enough friction force to hold the weight. So the compression mechanism needs to be strengthened 
from 20 tons to 40 tons. And the quick disconnect mechanism needs to be strengthened because it has to react that, that uh, compression load of the wheels and it has to be increased in capacity to 40 tons. And the Magnix motor doesn't have enough torque. And if you're gonna cut down the number of wheel pairs by a factor of two, you need a motor with twice as much torque. Well, how do you get a motor with twice as much torque? We thought, let's look at gear reducers because that's the standard way to get more torque out of a motor. Slow the motor down with a gear reducer that increases the torque at the output of the gearbox. So when we reduce to five wheel pairs, we have to increase the clamping force by a factor of two. We have to put at least a two to one reducer between the wheel and the motor and probably more because not everything scales by just the factor of two reduction. And then the only way to reduce the trip time is to be able to change the gear ratio. If you're fixed to a gear ratio of two, the trip takes twice as long. So this is why we wanted to look at, at um, transmissions. And the, so the motor torque problem is at the surface of the earth, you need the most torque you can get out of the motor. You need the full torque for almost 2,000 kilometers. At 2,600 kilometers up, the climber weighs half as much. If you could start the climber at 2,600 kilometers up, the Magnix motors would work just fine, okay? At 6,200 kilometers up, the climber only weighs a quarter of it weighs at the surface of the earth. So now the motors are just freewheeling. You don't even need the full torque. And that one over R squared relationship with gravity seemed like a natural for a speed changing device. Now, what we found out is that this speed changing device, the transmission, so here, here are other graphs of how gravity falls off as a surface, as a function of the distance away from the surface of the earth. And these graphs uh, exactly parallel the amount of power and the amount of torque required, because those are both directly related to the, to the acceleration due to gravity that the climber sees. So, we looked at speed increasers and speed reducers. And there are, oh, there's an enormous landscape of transmissions. Transmissions have been developed for the automotive industry for almost a century. And if you can't change the gears, the speed stays low. So that didn't seem like a very good uh, thing. There is a type of transmission which changes from a speed reducer to a direct drive to a, a speed increaser. And that would be ideal. And there's two basic types of transmissions, continuously variable transmissions, or the, the normal type that's in your car, which jumps from one gear ratio to another. And here is that enormous landscape of transmissions as a function of weight and torque capacity. But these torque capacities are all small fractions of the torque capacity that we need. We need torque capacities much higher than this. So I did some extrapolation from those charts. I, I basically drew a line through these ellipses and said, this is the low end, this is the high end. What if I extrapolate up to the range where we want, um, to, where, where our torque requirement is? And I found out that the typical weight of a continuously variable transmission would weigh three times as much as the motor. And a manual transmission or an automatic manual transmission capable of delivering the torque would weigh 1.8 times as much as the motor. If we're gonna double the weight of the motor, we're not getting anywhere. We're not moving forward. The climber is still turning out to be too heavy. So this extrapolation showed that adding a transmission is not going to help. So I started the design with the lightest, strongest motor I could find, and it was commercially available. And it doesn't have enough torque to be able to deliver payload up to geosynchronous orbit. So I said, okay, I'm gonna to have to imagine a new motor. I'm gonna to have to come up with a specification for a motor. And we were, are gonna to talk to motor manufacturers to see if it can be made with today's technology. And so we identified future motor development. I showed you how the Magnix motor is in a class by itself. Um, unfortunately, Electric aircraft design, which drives the, the weight requirement of the motor, is not a very large industry, and it's a very new industry, and there are definitely cost limitations on the motors that can be developed for airplanes. So we basically need a motor with twice as much torque, 
And some of the some of the lessons that we learned about motor technologies is the torque of the motor is linearly dependent on the volume of the rotor. So if you're stuck with copper windings and even good steel yokes in the rotor, you have to make the volume of the motor bigger. And, and because the volume is directly related to the mass, if you need twice as much torque from a copper steel motor, it becomes twice as heavy, that you're not gaining anything that way. Then the next thing we found out is that motors run with magnetic fields between one and one and a half Tesla. And the best magnetic materials saturate at about two Tesla magnetic fields. You don't want to drive the, the, the magnetic material in the motor much beyond its saturation point because that's an inefficient use of the magnetic field. So using copper and steel is, is probably not going to get you a factor of two in the torque increase. So we've thought about how can we increase the torque of the motors. And one possibility is if we can develop graphene wires to the point where they are commercially available and strong enough, it's, it, experiments have shown that they have a higher current carrying capacity than copper and they're much lighter than copper. So that's a possibility of stuffing more current into the motor. At that point, you might run into the saturation um, of the permeability of the magnetic materials. Now, another possibility is high temperature superconducting motors. Um, high temperature superconducting motors are still operating at a temperature on the order of 20 Kelvin. They, you can get rid of the iron core with a superconducting motor, but you have the additional mass penalty of a cryogenic system that, that keeps the motors cold on the order of 50 Kelvin, which is not necessarily trivial. And we did not go into the development of a cryogenic system uh, to look at its mass, but we do have a, me a mechanical engineer who's helping us talk, to, uh, an electric uh, mechatronic engineer who's helping us talk to motor manufacturers to see if it's possible to develop a motor that has the twice the torque capacity of the Magni 650 at 200 kilograms. So that's the assumption that I made. The assumption that I made is one way or another, we're going to get to a motor that's not available on the market yet. Now, there are other weight loss ideas. A lot of people say, oh, well, you've got this super strong material that you're gonna make the tether out of, why don't you make the climbers out of it? Um, first of all, the goal was to make a climber that was made out of as many commercially available materials as possible. <coughs> and since I don't know how to design with graphene, because we don't have graphene as a bulk material yet, I rejected it as something to uh, design the climber out. But we have something close. I started in aluminum because aluminum is the lightest, strongest, cheapest material readily available on the market. And I've looked at, and I'll show you how to look at all the materials available. There is practically no other engineering material in use today that shares all three of those characteristics simultaneously. You can get two of those characteristics and not the third. But a material that is lighter and stronger is carbon fiber reinforced polymer, uh, abbreviated CFRP. Uh, one thing that surprised me when I was designing the electrical bus bars for the climber I initially made them out of copper because copper has a uh, very good current carrying ability and the bus bars have to be designed to carry 2,500 amps of current. What I learned is that we, a lot of, and, and I should have known this because in the experiments I'm involved in, we make aluminum bus bars. We make aluminum bus bars because even though aluminum doesn't carry as much current per square millimeter of cross section as copper does, it is so much lighter than copper that aluminum bus bars that have the same current carrying ability as copper bus bars only weigh half as much, which is why you'll see in some of these pictures, the color of the bus bars changes from copper to aluminum. I, I, I changed the cross section of the bus bars uh, to make them uh, work with aluminum. But this is, this is an Ashby plot. So this is how you're able to look at all the materials available. And Ashby plots typically plot two material characteristics. In this plot, we plot strength of the material on a log-log plot against the density of the material. And what you find is that aluminum is in this band right here of uh, aluminum alloys that vary in strength, but are roughly the same density. And CFRPs, uh, the carbon fiber reinforced polymers, are in this area here, which is slightly stronger 
than the aluminums and lighter than the aluminums. So I did redesign a number of components of the structure of the climber for CFRP. Uh, it has to be done more carefully because designing with composites is totally different from designing with metals. But how does the cost figure in? Another Ashby plot compares the strength of materials against their relative cost per unit volume. And while CFRP is stronger and lighter than aluminum, it is also 10 times as expensive. And the shops that know how to fabricate parts out of CFRP are, are totally different from shops that know how to fabricate in aluminum. So our fabrication uh, facilities that are making climbers look completely different when we make them out of CFRP. And just out of curiosity, where do carbon nanotubes uh, uh, fall on, on Ashby plots? And I did not place uh, graphene on this plot, um, but they fall significantly above the strongest materials in the Ashby plot. And you can see woods are way down here. They're very light, but they're not very strong. Metals and alloys are very strong, but they're not, they're very heavy. And so carbon nanotubes in particular, I should add a point for graphene on here, uh, are, are significantly above where uh, most materials fall on an Ashby plot. So they are really useful materials once we get them in commercially available quantities. All right, so next step, and we are coming closer to the end. I hope I'm not going too fast for people. I, I redesigned the 10 wheel pair climber to make it into a five wheel pair climber. And I, I redesigned the compression mechanism. Uh, the jacks were increased to 20 tons from 10 tons. The quick disconnect mechanism probably needs to have its components made larger or made out of stronger materials, but I haven't checked that yet. There's a whole bunch of checking that has to go into uh, redesigning. Basically, I left the axles the same, even though I doubled the, uh, the force on them, because I felt we could move, we could derate the, uh, the lifetime of the axles a little bit, okay? Uh, the aluminum structure was replaced with the CFRP. And I, I went to a talk not too long ago that Elon Musk gave with a, um, an update on Starship. And he talked about how much fuel and locks the Starship needs to go to Mars. And the Starship needs to be refueled in orbit. And, and Elon's current plan is to refuel at, in low energy orbit by sending up uh, a, a heavy booster that is uh, basically a fuel tanker to, to refill the Starship at low Earth orbit. But I thought, if we can carry the locks up to geosynchronous orbit, uh, we can, and he can move the Starship up to geosynchronous orbit, we could be his, his refueling and refilling of locks. He likes to talk about refilling because it turns out he needs a lot more locks than he needs fuel. And the other thing about locks, since it's liquid oxygen, you're not going to get that from other sources in the solar system until we have a much more developed space economy, okay? LOX comes from Earth. It's going to be taken from our atmosphere and refrigerated and liquefied and sent in uh, uh, tanks, composite tanks, up into space. There's no sense talking about getting LOX from the moon or from Mars if you're not on the moon or Mars. So I designed composite LOX tanks that could support uh, 5,000 kilograms of LOX, five, basically five ton uh, composite vessels. And I looked at how would I hold these up off the climber? This is my five wheel pair climber with arms that I've designed attached to the support structure that connects the wheels together that hold out the LOX tanks. And you might notice there's an asymmetry here. The LOX tank on the opposite side from the wheel compression mechanism is longer, it's further away because I want the center of mass to be right on the tether, right between the wheels. If the LOX tank was the same distance as the LOX tank on the opposite side, the tether would have a tendency to rotate on the tether. It would put additional stresses and moments on the tether. We don't want that, okay? We want the center of mass of the climber to be centered on the contact patches between the wheels and the, and the tether. So that these arms are longer. So I started to look at those arms with a finite element analysis. And I could do an entire talk on what it took to develop the strength in these arms. But this is a, a rendering 
basically I had to double the number of arms and I had to connect the arms with a shear panel to prevent the amount of distress and deflection that I was seeing. So there has to be a detailed design. Now, this is not a practical design because these, these uh, shear panels cause assembly problems with the batteries and with some other things. So it, you really need to think carefully about how you do connections in CFRP and everything that's black here. The tether is black because it's imagined to be graphene. Everything else that's black is CFRP, except for these batteries. They're, they're a dark black color uh, just because in Inventor, the density of silicon rubber is about right for the density of, of uh, lithium sulfur batteries or lithium ion batteries. So that's why these are dark black. Um, <clears throat> and I apologize for the amount of black here, but so this was something that uh, I, I saw right away. The, even designing payload on the climber is non-trivial. So lessons learned from the payload arm design. Two halves are not symmetrical. Payload has to be placed symmetrically or asymmetrically to put the center of gravity on, on the middle. And then there's a relatively small axis. If you look, the distance between the structure and the axle is small. So getting this arm, which has to carry all the bending moment in here is, is tricky. And you might ask, well, why didn't you just make the length of the structure in between longer, making the wheel separation longer to give yourself more room for arms? At some point in the future, I or somebody else may have to do that but it's another trade-off because it makes the support structure of the climber heavier. And everything you add to the support structure of the climber takes away from the availability of mass for payload. These are all the trade-offs. So um, the other thing I learned is a five ton composite vessels full of locks take a lot of structure to hold up because you're, you're holding them out at arm's length. The arms need a significant strength. So the last problem I'm going to talk about before uh, ending this talk, and I could go on for another hour with other problems that we have begun to address that will appear in our, in our two-year study of the interface and the reference conceptual design of the climber. But the waste heat problem is the, another problem that the climber faces. The motors, even if they're 96% efficient, uh, if we limit the power to four megawatts, 4% inefficiency still means we have to reject over 160 kilowatts of power. And when you're in the vacuum of space, the only method you have of dissipating power is thermal radiation, which is governed by this equation for heat transfer. The heat transfer is equal to the Stefan Boltzmann constant multiplied by the emissivity of the material, the area of the material, and the hot temperature to the fourth power minus the cold temperature to the fourth power. And this is another interesting thing. We learned that the, the thermal radiator uh, out in space is only, it's going to lose 30% of its effectiveness if it is forced to look at the earth because the earth is a warmer cold reservoir than deep space. And you, and you don't wanna look at the sun at all. We, because of the ra thermal radiation coming from the sun, we need paint on our, uh, uh, our uh, thermal radiator surface that doesn't absorb sunlight, but keeps the emissivity as high as possible. And Dennis and I have done calculations on the thermal uh, uh, space radiator, assuming certain uh, high emissivity materials, and assuming that we can get the space radiator up to 200 degrees C, and we need 83 square meters of area. And, and other people have noticed that uh, it's harder to radiate heat away when the temperature of the radiator is kept low. If you're operating a fission reactor on the moon and you're cooling your fission reactor with liquid sodium, you can operate your space radiators at many hundreds of degrees C, which makes them smaller because they can, they can radiate heat away more effectively. But dissipating low temperature waste heat is a much bigger problem because the space radiators become huge. And this is a conceptual model of how big 83 square meters of, I made it transparent so you could see the climber inside of it. But again, this would be another carbon composite material, uh, probably similar to CFRP. Uh, it, it is 
seven meters in OD and it's 3.77 meters long. And it's, again, I apologize for the mixed units, 0.014 inches thick, because that is the optimal thickness of the carbon material that we found in a NASA paper for the design of uh, satellite space radiators. But um, this is how big a thermal radiator for 160 kilowatts needs to be. If we need to dump more heat than that, we either need to raise the temperature or we need a bigger radiator. And that's a big deal. Um, I have had on my list of things to do, looking at putting a refrigeration mechanism in there, which would allow us to make the thermal radiator hotter while keeping the components that are being cooled cooler, but I just haven't gotten around to it yet. And this is another example of some of the assembly questions. This is, the view of two climber halves separated going on to the tether at the earth port and all the different components that you can see. And, and it assumes that you have motorized gantries similar to the gantries that hold up rockets that can hold up the two halves of the climber, move them in position against the tether and connect them together using the quick disconnect mechanism. And it, and Either you then connect a power cord up to this device, which is capable of delivering 5,000 amps of current, or you begin the power beaming process using a photovoltaic array or something else. Uh, we know that travel through the atmosphere is by far the hardest part of the trip. And people are trying to find ways to avoid travel through the atmosphere. And, I, and if we can avoid travel through the atmosphere, great. But if not, we have to design a tether and a climber that can withstand things like wind. And uh, the thermal radiator here is clearly a wind problem because it is a sail in wind. And we may have to figure out, because uh, if the climber does start in atmosphere, you have the atmosphere to dump heat into. And the atmosphere is very good at dumping heat away from something. So we may be able to stow or reduce the drag coefficient of the thermal space radiator uh, when it's in the atmosphere and uh, deploy it above the atmosphere where you don't have to worry about things like wind. But it's pictures like this that begin to give you the idea of, for example, if the payload is inside the thermal space radiator, now you have to think of the climber as a machine that is integrated with its payload and its uh, uh, heat shield before you even connect it to the other half. Because you wouldn't be able necessarily, I mean, per perhaps you could use a crane to lower the payload into the heat shield, but you'd have to also then have people working inside here. So there's, I'm just saying there are so many issues that need to be worked out about the process at the earth port of attaching a climber. So what are the conclusions? For years, more than a decade, we've wanted 20 ton climbers to carry 13 tons of payload, the 65% payload ratio. The five wheel pair climber shown can carry 10 tons of payload. So it has a 50% payload ratio to any altitude. And that's what makes it different from rockets. Rockets have payload ratios of a few percent, which get lower and lower the further the payload is delivered and chemical rockets can't do any better because you're already operating as hot as chemistry can allow. Um, there may come a time in the future when we can do better than 50%. Uh, it will be in the future. And 50% um, compared to 65% is not bad, but it assumes that we can find or design the motor that we need, which is twice as good as those Magni aircraft motors. We need, we need more torque than we can get from currently available motors. So we need a motor research program. And then once the tether material is developed, we'll have other strong and light composite materials that can lighten other parts of the structure. But the thing that people have to remember is there, are, there is every stress state possible in the climber. We have tension, we have compression, we have bending. For compression in particular, Making the material the strongest material in the world may not help because buckling 
does not care how strong your material is. It's only a function of the cross-sectional area and the Young's modulus of the material. So graphene or other strong materials that are excellent in tension may not be the solution for a, a part which is being in compression or bending. And then the final thought is that uh, you, we have to do a lot of thought to make the climber assemblable around the tether. It's a multi-step process that will take preparation time for each lift off. And that is what I have. And I hope the audience has survived this presentation. <laughs> I have one backup slide if, you're, if people are interested. Another thing I haven't quite gotten to yet, I compared the mass of the next shaft coupling, which is capable of managing the twice torque uh, uh, between the motor and the, and the axle. And it weighs much more than the shaft couplings that are in the model. And the limitations on this style of shaft coupling are in the bearings. So this is another example where we, we may go with a custom designed shaft coupling, but we are definitely gonna be limited by materials. And uh, are there any questions? Uh, yeah, and before we get to the questions, uh, Larry, <laughs> I am just going to just, for those of you, I'm just gonna go back to our uh, original PowerPoint here and thank Larry. That's a great presentation. There was a lot of information, a lot of math, and I'm sure Larry will be very happy to go in depth with you at some point if you so choose to go into depth with the, the um, to the math. So if you want to stay in touch with ISIC, we have a newsletter, a monthly newsletter. Go to the ISIC website, ISIC.org. Scroll all the way down to the bottom. There is a sign up list for our newsletter and we put those out every month. And then if you would consider being a member, it helps us since we are an all volunteer organization and we're doing, uh, people are volunteering their time to to create these studies, to do the research. So um, if you have, there's the, the uh, membership fees that are on the, the uh, screen there, go to the website. You can join and support our uh, endeavor here. And then of course, we do have another webinar coming up. And if you go to events, it'll be up on the site in a little bit. Uh, and we will be discussing some other things in regards to the space elevator. I want to thank you. I'm Karen Gleason. I've been the producer for this event. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and open the floor up for questions. So if you have a question, uh, you all have mic rights. You can go ahead and unmute yourselves. Just be aware that of your surroundings and hopefully we can hear you all, but uh, background surroundings so that we don't have a lot of background noise. And if you're not speaking, please stay on mute, but then unmute to ask your question. Or if you feel more comfortable, go ahead and type your question in the chat. So with that, who has questions? I covered everything there. There must not be any questions. Yes, so you've, you've done a great job there, Larry. Uh, anyone have any questions or? Anything? Hello, this is Jacob Wade. I have a question. Go right ahead. So how do you plan to get the structure from the ground into space as one solid piece of, I guess, uh, a carbon or aluminum, whatever that structure is, from the ground to space like an elevator? Would it be one tall structure like a tube? So there are a number of uh, books and references for that. What you're talking about is how do we, how do we get the, the, the tether up there? That is a whole process which is completely dependent on exactly what the tether is made out of. And in, in Brad Edwards' book, he imagined that uh, you would boost up spools of carbon nanotubes into low Earth orbit, then you would eventually boost those spools to geosynchronous orbit, where you'd begin to unwind them one end towards the surface of the earth and the spool would go out to 100,000 kilometers where it would act as a, as a counterweight. If you're making the, the tether out of another material like a graphene or hexagonal boron nitride or something like that, it completely depends on what the deployment scheme for that material is. Uh, for graphene, uh, we don't know if the spool method boosted up to low earth orbit works, or if we have to actually layer the graphene layers on a factory in orbit 
to, to make the multi-layered graphene uh, tether that, that we've been talking about. We're not exactly sure what it's going to take. And it all depends on the form that the material is produced in on the surface of the earth and what it takes to, to get it to its full strength and full length. Okay. So that makes sense. It, you're basically sending it from space to earth instead of from earth into space. Right. You, you okay. need to keep the center of mass in any deployment scheme. You need to keep the center of mass near geosynchronous orbit. Otherwise, the, the, the cable material, the tether material, will move with respect to the base on Earth. And, and that would not be good for an elevator. You can't grab onto it. You right. need to keep the center of mass at, at geosynchronous orbit. OK, cool. Thank you. Hi, this is Hadley Reed. Uh, I, in making the decision to uh, increase the force of compression, in order to reduce the number of wheels. Uh, how does that uh, impact uh, uh, design specifications or requirements for the tether material itself, since you're squeezing it twice as hard? That's an excellent question. And we have been looking at that. Actually, that is the focus of the two-year study. And I have to admit that I have sidetracked the two-year study into looking at the, the overall design of the climber. But the study was supposed to focus on exactly what the characteristics of the climber tether interface is. And what I can tell you is what we think is the case now is that any metal that the wheels would be made out of would have a limiting compression strength compared to the tether. That basically you can squeeze the tether orders of magnitude harder than you can squeeze the wheels. And that's the answer, right? It's, it, you have to design for the survivability of the wheels and the tether is capable of doing it. That, that is fascinating uh, that the wheels rather than the tether material because always historically the focus has been on finding the holy grail of tether materials. Uh, has anyone, uh, I realize this is tangential to your discussion, but has anyone looked at ways to increase the coefficient of friction of the tether material? We have, we have actually, we, we have a number of ideas. Um, what was learned quite a while ago is that if you're talking about carbon nanotubes, they have different coefficients of friction depending on whether a carbon nanotube is moving perpendicular to another carbon nanotube or parallel to another carbon nanotube. And in the case of carbon nanotubes, the coefficient of friction for crossed carbon nanotubes is much higher. Uh, it's it's uh, way more than 0.1 uh, than for parallel carbon nanotubes. So one possibility then is you can coat the wheel with a, with a material that has a higher coefficient of friction with respect to the grain direction basically of the tether material. Uh, with graphene, we've had a couple of ideas. There's a paper that came out that says you can increase the coefficient of friction with a, a surface of graphene by hydrogenating the surface, by attaching hydrogen atoms to 10% of the surface area, you can increase the coefficient of friction of graphene significantly. And anything we can do to increase the coefficient of friction is going to make the design of the climber easier because it will take less forces and there'll be lower stresses on the climber and metal fatigue will become less of an issue. Anybody else? So I know graphene is conductive. Is it possible over this kind of distances to use it as a power cable? Not over the full distance to geo. It remains to be seen whether that's a useful characteristic uh, at, at, at shorter amounts. Like where, where we need to drive the most current is close to the surface of the earth. And, and if you can drive the current through a short enough length but graphene's electrical resistivity is, is not, it's not a superconductor, okay? So you are losing I squared R losses, which will heat up the tether if you drive it a certain length. So that needs to be figured out. Be great if it was a superconductor. <laughs> Hi there, it's uh, John Ricks here. 
Uh, just a question about the uh, construction of the tether. I understand that you, you know, there's still a lot of investigation going into what is the best material for the tether. But um, so carbon nanotubes, for example, how how is the tether manufactured from the nanotubes? I know that there are limitations at the moment in terms of the length of the nanotubes that can be manufactured. Um, is there a binding material that's used with those, or is there some way of bonding them directly? I don't, I, I don't know enough about it. Since you? There's been a, there's been a, a uh, I, I've actually seen carbon nanotube fabric, which is a composite material where the, the nanotubes are pretty short. This is, a, this is a problem because what you actually need is you need to determine whether or not the sheer strength of a lap joint in the material can equal the tensile strength of the cross section of the material. You can make a tether any length you want if the shear strength of a lap joint can equal the tensile strength of the, of the tether because you can always join additional lengths, okay? And that's the challenge of making a 100,000 kilometer long tether. Now, we have textile industries that are capable of spinning out miles and miles of thread and fiber and even fabric. And we need to adapt those technologies to make tether material, but we have to we have to get to the point where where we learn how to join it. Another reason why we need to learn how to join it is the tether is going to suffer degradation from micrometeoroids and debris and other things, and we need to be able to figure out how to fix it, how to patch it, especially when it's under stress. Yep. And um, in order to to get the material into space, if you're, you're launching a spool on a rocket, what's the the, the flexibility of the material, um, I guess that's still to be answered as well, that you can actually spool it up to begin with. We, we've had a lot of arguments about this, and it turns out that the material is typically so thin that it, it has very little bending resistance, and, and you okay. should be able to spool it on any reasonable size spool, okay. even if it's the strongest material in the world, like grass. Thank you. Now, some materials that are more ceramic-like um, for if you're if you're thinking theoretically about the characteristics of the of the tethered material, we want to be careful about very brittle materials, and we want to be careful about materials that once you cause a small failure in them, they literally unzip. So these are things that that we need to think about in terms of defects and the robustness, the survivability of the tethered material. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Appreciate that. I'd just like to comment, uh, Larry. It is incredibly encouraging the amount of effort that so many people are putting in, and, and you're certainly among them. Uh, if, if space elevators are going to become a reality, and it sure looks like they are, uh, and I don't want to be too uh, discouraging, Dr. Swan, but boy, is there a lot of work involved. Uh, thank you so much for the thousands and thousands of hours that you and many, many others are putting in. You're welcome. It's a hobby. I deliberately do not keep track of the hours I spend working on this because people don't keep track of the hours they spend on hobbies, right? <laughs> okay. It's urging to keep track. Yeah. So, so I'll jump in here. Um, hi, Larry. Nice to meet you. I, uh, Bruce McKenzie here. I've been on the periphery of ISEC um, since before it was founded, actually. Um, I have a, a, a bunch of minor points that are best addressed um, separately. I'm sure you've thought of them. Let me address the thing about friction. Someone asked, can you increase the, 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 um, um, the friction by, by coating the tether? Bear in mind, so I, I'm addressing this to the rest of the audience. If you add a nonstick coating to the tether, you have to add it for thousands and thousands, you know, hundred thousand kilometers, and it would be, it could be very heavy. Much better to. It's not a nonstick coating. It's well, a stick coating. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a sticky coating, and and <laughs> you know maybe you only add it to the first six thousand kilometers, but anyway, it would be much better, much lower weight to add something that is stickier on the wheels than on the tether because of the length of the tether. That's a good point. That's a very good point. You definitely so, want to minimize whatever that, that interaction is. So um, 
my most important question is, I think they're called serpentine drive where the wheels are spaced kind of in an S pattern and the tether goes back and forth in an S pattern between wheels. So yes. you have greater surface. Um, okay. So would you, would you address we, that? We refer to that as cap standing because that's the way a cap stand winch works when you wrap the tether material around it. And there's a couple of things I personally don't like about cap standing. Um, when I've seen people use the equations that you can pull out of Shigley for calculating the amount of traction that you get from a belt drive running on a wheel or from a brake drum, something like that, uh, I don't think those calculations are appropriate to the cap standing effect. So I question whether or not the additional traction from the point of the, uh, in between points of literal contact, I, I, I question whether or not the wrap is giving them as much friction as they'd like. The other question is, do we wanna be deforming the tether in that way? Does that represent an additional strain to the tether that causes a wear or reduction in the life of the tether? We won't know that until some point in the future. But, but first, I don't trust the, the traction from it. And second, I think it may be an additional wear mechanism that we don't want. Is it a possible, uh, possibly useful mechanism? Yeah, it might be. And I can see how to do a climber with it. Yeah. Okay, um, another minor question. I, uh, you talk about spherical roller bearings. I know what a roller bearing is and I know what a ball bearing is with spherical balls. What is a spherical roller? So a, a, uh, it's not a spherical roller, it's a spherical roller bearing. The races are designed such that the inner race can rotate some number of degrees with respect to the outer race. And that means the rollers are moving on a spherical surface inside the outer race and a spherical surface, a concave surface inside the outer race and a convex surface uh, inside the, or outside the inner race. So it's a method of absorbing angular offset in bearings. Okay, I was not aware of that, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? What was that? Yeah, there's actually a, a uh, whole family May I ask you a classes. question? Yes? Sorry. Uh, uh, thank you for your presentation. And you mentioned about the heat con heat uh, problem of the climber, right? Yes. And uh, I, I yes, uh, we have another way to dissipate the heat by uh, through the tether uh, conduction. Yeah, and climber uh, the roller of the climber and the tether is uh, con have conduction, so we all. We can also uh, dissipate the heat through the tether. Uh, how, uh, what do you think of this idea? It, you're right. There is a conductive path to the tether, and the tether uh, yeah. is a thermally conductive material. So yes. uh, that is a possible mechanism. Now, I'm not sure exactly how to evaluate its effectiveness because the thermal contact area between the wheel and the tether is very narrow. So, you, so if you treat that as the thermal resistance point, you would have to calculate how hot does the wheel have to get to conductively transfer that heat into the tether across that thermal interface. Um, it's, a, it's a worthwhile calculation to do. It's one that I haven't done yet. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Um, I have a question. So in previous calls and many discussions about this, it seems that some of the problem of the space elevator is solved by not treating it as like a single stage to orbit. Um, if you have sort of an atmosphere portion and then a space portion even, it eliminates a lot of the problems. Have you focused specifically on you know, what it would take to have a tether climber just purely in space and how much of a different challenge is that compared to one that can do atmosphere and space with the same climber? We argue about these questions all the time. Now, I am not one of the ones who has been researching high stage one or, or the, the high altitude platforms. 
there, but there are other people in Isaac who are doing that. Um, it is absolutely the case that the character, the, the conditions that the climber has to go through in atmosphere are completely different. And uh, there are people who think that the wind speed is a very difficult problem because even at, at the width of the tether that I've shown, which is 0.3 meters, there's so much drag from a typical wind in the atmosphere that the tether would actually need to be much, much heavier and stronger to resist the action of the wind. So, so one of the proposals, and as a matter of fact, one of the guys on this call, Peter Robinson and John Knappman are gonna give a talk at the IAC about a, a Peter's concept of putting a pulley system above the atmosphere. And they like cables because the round cross section of the cable get, offers very little drag to any, any wind. And then you would, you would basically hoist up a climber to the point where you can then attach it to the tether above the pulley and operate as I've described above the atmosphere. We right. are all still working on these ideas. Sure, and and about I, I guess I wanted to focus on just the one piece of, there are various ways that we've come up with how to just do the atmosphere part. I guess my question is specifically for the climber mechanism, do we have high confidence that the current design would operate on graphene in space? If we can get it there somehow, some way. Oh yeah, um, oh yeah. No, I, if I had to ignore all those other influences, um, absolutely the climber design that I showed you, even with that large cylindrical shell for a space radiator, that would have no trouble climbing in vacuum. No trouble at all. I mean, the heat is a problem. We have to figure out the heat balance of the climber, but the, the wind issues and other issues in the atmosphere represent a completely different set of problems. And, and you, you'd have to figure out what to do with the space radiator to prevent the climber from becoming a sail in the atmosphere. Now, these, I, these think, are... I think this is one reason why discussions of using an a lunar space elevator uh, have uh, uh, shown such greater promise in, in terms of uh, sure. uh, technical issues compared to uh, a, uh, a Terran space elevator. Even a Martian elevator is easier. You can, you can make Martian elevators and lunar elevators out of materials that we have today. Let, let me respond to that one real quickly also, this Pete Swan. Uh, I believe we should have elevators on all the bodies. Uh, there's a very efficient way to move things, and it's an excellent idea. And there's some really good ideas about putting elevators on Phobos and going up and down that way. But we have a basic problem, and that is getting out of the stupid Earth's gravity. That dominates everything. I mean, everything. And so let's solve that problem and create a robust movement off planet. Once we've done that, let's put an elevator wherever you want. Uh, there are a lot of people that have designed lunar elevators, Jerome Peterson, all kinds of people. It's an excellent idea, but let's get off the earth first. That's my idea, Pete. Here, here, here. My, my personal take is I've always assumed that I was designing a climber that started at the surface of the earth. And, and that implied that the tether was as strong as it needed to be to resist things like wind drag. And, and that does change the, the deployment scenario, the economics slightly. Um, there's all kinds of things that, that uh, are dependent on that. But I, I don't think climbing from the surface of the earth is impossible. <laughs> if I, perhaps if I perhaps not impossible, impossible, but I mean, from various talks I heard, you know, we're not sure exactly what graphene's exposure will be in atmosphere either of how reactive it will be in the air, which is another hurdle that needs to be solved. And sure. I, I'm not gonna like have a strong position on what is the best way to get from zero to uh, out of atmosphere. But I do think that if we can come up with a stabilized design for the going from say 100 kilometers to 100,000 kilometers, I feel like we've solved a lion's share of the lifting problem. And then we just need to solve that last little hundred kilometers. And there are various ways to do that. You know, it could be a steel cable. It could be different launch systems. It could be actually powered by electricity from the ground. 
Like there are lots of different possible methods if you can just get it there and then you get the whole rest of it. We know, we know right now that from 2,600 kilometers and up, the Magnix motor has sufficient torque to lift the climber. You could use a commercially available motor from 2,600 kilometers up. Getting to 2,600 kilometers is a totally different matter, which is why we need stronger motors. So sure. if I could jump in now, um, side note, I'd like, it, so Pete Swan said, let's put an elevator on every body. I'd like to see his design for a space elevator for the sun. But um, seriously, um, what about a first stage tug, a, a, a separate climber that goes underneath the main climber and pushes it up, something like a tugboat? And it could have an extra large radiator, batteries, stronger motors, and then it, it, it stops it's several thousand kilometers up and lets the, the, uh, the lighter weight climber go, go the rest of the way. Bruce. Uh, tug follows the same design rules as the climber I've laid out. What you've basically done is said, we're going to put a climber whose payload is a climber. Yes, yes, but, but it can be optimized for that. It could be larger. Uh, it doesn't have a separate payload. So its only purpose is to get the, 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 uh, the other climber, the, the smaller climber. So, um, so actually, I, I have thought about that. And one of the concepts that I thought was, was kind of interesting was a tow line. If I can drop a tow line from 2,600 kilometers where I have a climber latched onto the tether, drop a tow line down, then I can aid a climber that's just now trying to take off. But a 2,600 kilometer tow line is a nightmare in terms of organization and trying to keep it from whipping around and just yada yada. Yeah, and I think that's no better than just making the 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 lower twenty six hundred of the of the tether stronger. So it, it, it's it's really just another space elevator. That's a good point. That is a good point. No, we, he, no, but seriously, this this extra heavy duty pusher. Um, people people it, have proposed that. So he, so, proposed it, that. He, so it could have different motors. You know, better radiator. Maybe use um, evaporative cooling. Um, and it, but it only you know goes a short distance where it is optimized for, and then the main the the main climber is optimized for the rest of the trip. Sure, sure. It, I believe you can see uh, concepts like that in the 2013 climber study. Okay. All right, we have time for one last question, and uh, that's from Yuma, who asked in chat rollers transform elastically because they push each other, then that makes heat. I have heard that the heat made rollers melt. Do you have any way to let it escape anywhere? Okay, that is, we, that is absolutely uh, something that needs to be calculated. We have been looking at the elastic deformation of the rollers now because we need to limit the contact stress to numbers that allow the, the material of the wheel to survive fatigue, that means we're not pushing the rollers hard enough together to cause them to melt, okay? So they, they will possibly get hotter and then it will become another portion of waste heat that we have to eliminate and probably that waste heat would be conducted away on the tether. But I, there's there's very little chance that I can see of getting to the point where we're squeezing the wheels hard enough together that they're melting. All right. Well, I see. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Larry. Uh, Jam-packed information. And as I was typing in chat, I'll get the recording and a PDF of the slides that were used for the presentation. They'll be up on the website. I dropped the link in chat. It's basically under resources and recorded webinars on our website. And as I said, we are going to be having another online event coming up soon. And in that event, I'll just give you a little teaser. It will be for members only. And we're looking at perhaps putting together an expert panel. So make sure you go ahead and become a member in order to receive that information and look for more information in our newsletter going forward. 
Thanks everyone for joining us today and uh, have a good rest of your day, everyone. Many, many, many thanks. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thanks, Karen and Larry. Thanks, Great. Thank you. Great show. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.